I'm Chris William, and welcome to the special online version of Carolina Business Review. We have been, over the course of this public health crisis and this pandemic, reaching out to those who are leading in North and South Carolina to find out how they feel. Joining us now is the Chairman of the State Board of Education in North Carolina, the Honorable Eric Davis. He joins us, uh, looks like, from the safety of his own home. I, I'm assuming you are being safe, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to this dialogue, and thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, Eric, let's, let's start with the obvious question. As we all approach the fall, and especially when it comes to primary education in the Carolinas and certainly in North Carolina, what do we need to do to get to a decision on reopening schools, either on time or close to on time? And whose job is that to take responsibility of making that decision? Certainly. Well, like... Um nearly everything in our education system, Chris, it's, it's pretty complex and there's a series of answers to a, what otherwise is a simple question. Um, the first responsibility clearly in, in this case rests with our governor as the uh, executive leader managing the, the um, crisis that we're in statewide. But, um, but others also have a role, Department of Health and Human Services and the State Board. We're advising the governor on aspects of school reopening. And, and we, I know on the State Board, we do that in partnership with members of the General Assembly, as well as superintendents and other education leaders across our state at various levels in the education system. So um, the, the announcement we all await is from the governor, but I think it's important for the citizens that we serve to know that, um, that his decision is uh, affected by the advice and counsel that we're all providing. And I know I just spent this weekend talking to colleagues on the state board, asking what are they hearing? What's their individual perspective? Mm -hmm. What's their judgment? And um, not surprisingly, we have a range of opinions on our board, which actually I think reflects pretty accurately the range of opinions across our state. And so the announcement specifically is the governor's responsibility, but I think an important part of the answer to your question, what will it take to reopen our schools? We all have a responsibility in what it's gonna take to reopen our schools because first and foremost, since our schools reflect the health of our communities, we need to get this virus transmission under control. We've got to rein in the amount of spread that the virus is occurring in our state. And thank goodness we're not sp spiking like some other states, but we're not headed in the right direction. And so the first step is we've got to work together, everyone doing their part to not only take care of ourselves, but take care of each other and limit the spread. And then second, continue the work we're doing at providing personal protective equipment, providing safeguards and screening, and doing everything we can that on the actual school grounds, once the students leave our communities and enter our school grounds, that we're creating a safe environment. So let's unpack that for just a second, Mr. Chairman. So, well, two, two questions. What is the governor's announcement sometime this week? Would, would that go a long way in relieving some people's anxiety about what a start looks like, first question. Second question is how do you prioritize some of those things that you alluded to about kid safety, family safety, getting kids out of a home that may be abusive and or at risk in general, teachers at risk. I mean, so answer the question about the governor and then how do you weight all those other decisions that get the board and other counties to the point where they'll feel good about a reopen. Sure. So I do anticipate that the governor will make an announcement this week on what plan that we'll implement on August 17th for school reopening. So that'll happen, anticipate this week. Whether it will relieve or in some cases increase anxiety is up to the individual perspective. I think in many cases it will will relieve our superintendents anxiety. They will now have a direction about which way to go and they'll move right into implementation mode. And so that will cause forward movement and I think a real positive state of, of energy and parents will get a clearer picture about what to expect. So then parents can start to make choices. And so 
I do think that will create a positive. I also think there will be some, um, some response um, and not satisfied with whatever announcement is made. It's just the variety of opinions that we have across the state. And so we will need to, uh, re to respond to that. And it, here's an example. I, I wouldn't be surprised if 25% of our parents somewhere in that neighborhood don't elect to keep their children in remote instruction. They just are not comfortable, regardless of what we do, sending their children back. So a quarter. And so of it's important say, for our school districts to offer that choice. Yeah. So the, you, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Then a quarter of the parents uh, want to send them back. Will send them back. Is that what you're saying? It wouldn't be a surprise. To That's you? what I'm hearing from some of our superintendents who have done the legwork of of asking parents for input um, about what they would like to do in the fall. Some have told me uh, as many as 25 percent. What's so then? What what do you debate within the the, the walls of the of the state board of education, or when you interact with the Department of Public Instruction, about what the priorities to get the decision get to a fair and equitable decision is? Well, I, I think first and foremost, our, our members of our board are universal about the the reality that our children learn best in our schools. And our teachers do their best teaching when they're in our schools. And so it's a matter of moving from where we are now, totally remote, gradually back into more and more of our students safely in our schools. Um, here's another thought on that, Chris, is that we, you know, we, we support a range of students from, from kindergarten through 12th grade. The younger our children, they have um, different health characteristics than our older children who are more likely reflect adult in terms of transmission and so forth. Another reality is that our younger children are the ones who most need to be in school. Just can't teach kindergarten nearly as effectively remote as you can high school biology. Do you, so do you mean from an academic or a social yes. slash mental health? I, absolutely, the whole, the, all aspects. So, such a big part of, of schooling in the early grades is, is the academic, but it's also the social interaction and, and, and the things that just need to be taught face to face. Mm -hmm. And then in addition, we, um, we have a lot of students, exceptional children and students who don't have broadband access and children who, do, who have less support at home. It's critical, regardless of their age, that those students are some of our first to come back into our school. And while we're going through this phase period, the children who have the most in-person instruction as we move down this journey to full in-person instruction for all students. So, so our younger students, our exceptional children, students, our children who do not speak English as a primary language, our children who do not have broadband access and other supports, those are a real priority. And that's exactly what I think our districts are working on, our superintendents are working on right now in terms of their plan. What, uh, getting back to the children, let's just take a minute or two and talk about the, the, the children that are at risk from the, the, the meal standpoint, that they don't have a square meal, uh, that there might be abuse in the home that's not being reported now or not being noticed or, or noted. Um, how, how much of, of that true at-risk children is factored in to this decision? A great deal. Absolutely great deal. That's one reason why we want to get to, to all children in school as fast as we can, because we can reach more children and particularly those that uh, are most vulnerable. But um, I understand that so many of our district plans are focused on meeting the needs of children that you just described during this interim phase as we, if we move through a gradual reentry. So it's critical that we meet the needs of uh, really all children, but specifically those who rely on our schools the most. That there's another aspect of this, if I could go beyond just children for, for a moment. I'm very concerned about our care and support for teachers and other staff. 
many members of our staff themselves are vulnerable to this virus, mm -hmm. or they support and care for family members who themselves are vulnerable. And um, we've sent quite a bit of money to districts to try to care for that. We've um, continued to do more, but it's gonna take a lot more than we've done up to now, just for uh, personal protective equipment, for screening, for care. And the fact of the matter, Chris, is we'll do more as a state, but only the federal government has the vast resources necessary to deal with falling tax revenue and increasing needs in our schools. It's gonna take the federal government stepping up and supporting children and teachers all over our nation mm -hmm. in order so, for us to move through this pandemic. Again, excuse me, sorry for interrupting you, sir. So when State Superintendent of Education in North Carolina, Mark Johnson, says that the federal emergency dollars that are intended for, as you described it, are, I'm not going to use the term redirected, but are deployed beyond what emergency needs and services are, as the board recently voted in, in an overwhelmingly way. Does he have a point when it comes to the spirit of those funds being used for other than emergency? Or is that how you see it? So the decision the board made last week was about 10% of the CARES Act initial funding, which totaled about $38 million. And the difference in the two plans was the superintendent proposed that we spend 15 million on childcare, which is a noteworthy and needed uh, fact out in our communities. Parents need childcare. The board committee that brought the alternative proposal said instead of 15 million, we ought to spend 4.7 million on childcare, but we ought to spend 10 million on our exceptional children because their needs have grown exponentially because of COVID. Yes, they had needs before COVID. We needed childcare before COVID, but the needs of our exceptional children have been exacerbated by COVID. So that is appropriate from a federal relief standpoint. And second, four and a half million to care for and do more for our low performing schools, who are also the schools that have the most children that you just described, mm -hmm. who don't have broadband access, who need to be in school. And so um, the decision, and, and here's another, another aspect of that decision. Childcare, while noteworthy, can also be supported by other agencies, health and human services and so forth and others. The education of our exceptional children, the focus on our low performing schools, we're the only agency that has that responsibility. Mm -hmm. So it came down to a matter of priority. And in, in my view, I think the board made the right choice. Let's zoom out since we're on fiscal issues. Let's zoom out a little bit and talk about, let's assume, and, and this might be a little bit hyperbolic, Mr. Chairman, but let's assume that most school districts' budgets are going to be, uh, if not highly impacted, maybe in some cases eviscerated. And as we go through this issue over the next six or 12 months and assume that we have more than an emergency issue in, in budgetary issues, does this give State Board of Education, counties, superintendents an opportunity to reshuffle priorities to what might be more ideal for schools as we've been debating this in the Carolinas for many years? Do we have an opportunity to say, let's reshuffle priorities to what we really are trying to get to? Well, I think what this pandemic has done is it has highlighted and exposed the priorities that the state board has been advocating for for years. It's just made it more important or more visible or more noticeable to, to our citizens across the state. Things like broadband access, things like school nurses and counselors and social workers, things like the need for more teachers and more teachers assistance to be able to connect with students effective way. I mean, last week at our board meeting, we reviewed and we'll consider next month a strategic action plan that includes a determined and focused effort on equity. Those are things we have been working. They've become that much more urgent, that much more important as a result of this pandemic. And, and I'm really pleased that, that despite working day and night to respond to this pandemic, the board is actually looking long-term 
beyond next year or into future years. So we'll be better prepared the next time and we will solve many of the issues that the pandemic has made even more critical. So when you talk about equity, I'm, I'm assuming you're referring to the Leandro decision and does that, does that give even more, is there a risk that Leandro, the, the ruling in the Leandro case doesn't get lost in the shuffle of the emergency of the present day? So the equity focus is broader than Leandro. Leandro is just one lens to, to look at the equity issues through. Um, there, is, there is a risk, obviously, that is, until our economy can rebound and our revenues can increase, that our ability for our state to fund what we need in greater amounts will be impacted. That's, that's a reality that we all have to face. But what we also need to face is the reality that our system, our education system, is designed for those students that today it's currently supporting quite well. And it needs to be redesigned to support those students who we're not reaching and we're not supporting. And, and in doing so, make for a more, more robust, vibrant, stronger, more resilient education system that produces graduates across all spectrums of our society that are prepared to become contributing members of society. That's the equity issue that North Carolina in particular faces our economic vitality and the stability and our ability to compete and win with other states and other nations depends on maximizing the human capital in our children, their talents and expertise. We can't afford to have a single one not contribute to our common good. That's the equity issue. Uh, Chairman Davis, thanks for taking time. Thank you for your leadership and everyone on the board that is uh, of, of, of making the contribution and, and sticking to it. Uh, our best to the board, to DPI and all those that work with, and thank you again for your leadership. My pleasure.